Jason Lote and I'm a geometer and I'm interested at the moment in thinking about covering geometric objects with smallest shapes. So what does this mean? So if I take a sphere and I want to try to cover it with shortest curves, I can do that but I can't do it so that none of the curves intersect. If I take two equators, they'll always meet at two points. But if I take a torus instead, then I can cover that with shortest curves. What I want to think about is doing this in higher dimensions. In particular, I'm thinking about seven dimensions and covering it with four-dimensional shortest objects. Why would you want to do that? Well, it turns out that such objects are not only interesting mathematically, but they're very important in string theory and M-theory. And so that's why we want them. We want to build them so we can help to understand the shape of our universe. Hi, so I'm Sam, I'm a mathematician. And what I'm really interested in is decision making when you don't know exactly what's going to happen. In particular, the sort of problem that I want to understand is what happens when I make a plan today, but tomorrow I might change my mind when I get new information, when somehow my understanding of the world has changed. Now, this comes up in lots of areas. It's in uh, finance, in risk management. It comes up in medicine. It comes up in automation generally, and we're getting more and more automation in the world. So it's interesting to understand these rules. So how can new information change your mind? How is it that if I make a plan, I might not follow through? And understanding this, I hope, will lead us to do better ways of understanding how to make plans in the future. I spend a lot of time thinking about shape and in particular holes or trapped volumes in shape. If you walk through your door in the evening into your house, the only reason you can do that is because there's a trapped volume there, which you might refer to as a room. If there's a mouse living in your house as well, then um, there's another trapped volume, provided that the mouse has a door, um, which has a very different scale to the first one. Now, both of these holes are very important to the function of the house. I work in topological data analysis and I'm particularly interested in biological networks and in studying holes at various scales in these networks in various dimensions to learn something about the function of the underlying biological system. Um, looking at data in this way you can learn uh, many things uh, about, for example, neuroscience or um, cancer research. So I'm a mathematician and very few people know what that is, including my family, even though I've been explaining it for years upon years upon years. They have these vague notions, everyone has these vague notions, that I kind of sit around and play with numbers all day long, think about twos and threes and things. But I don't. Some mathematicians do, but not all mathematicians do. I am a decidability theorist, so I am interested in more philosophical questions about when algorithms do or do not exist. I don't care about how fast these algorithms are or even how to code them or anything like that. I just care about when they exist and when they don't exist. And to me, that's what a large portion of maths is. It's these philosophical questions with a slightly logical twist, because to me, that's what maths is all about. You think deeply about something, you add a bit of logic in, and then you get something really beautiful in the end. Let me tell you a little bit about my research by these uh, two sets of pictures. On the left, I started off with a square of side length one and cut out the middle third. And that leaves me with eight squares, and in each of those, I cut out the middle third. And that leaves me with 64 squares, and each one I cut out the middle third. You complete this uh, process forever, you end up with a, a fractal called the Sapinski carpet. It's very interesting. It's a shape that's somewhere between one and two dimensional. Okay. And there's a very particular notion of dimension called conformal dimension, which we know is between one or two, but we don't know exactly what it is. What it's related to is this thing, a hyperbolic cone. You start off with a point corresponding to your one square, eight points corresponding to your eight squares, 64 points corresponding to your 64 squares, and you connect these up to make this huge graph, which is called the hyperbolic cone. Now, what my work does is it relates how well connected this hyperbolic cone is as a network with the conformal dimension of Sapinski carpet. Most of you use Google, I suppose. Anytime you search for something, you can search in Google. You can type some keywords. It's going to give you access to all sorts of documents that are associated to, to these keywords. But the thing is that for mathematical equations, there is no such thing. There is no search engine for equations. 
So there are all sorts of books where you have compilations of equations. They are classified in all sorts of ways. But what would be cool to have is a, is a system where you can type an equation and it gives you access to all of the documents, research papers, books, contexts in which these equations naturally appear. And why is it interesting? Well, because usually equations are associated to processes, to some re real mechanisms. And what I would like to have is a system where you can type an equation and it tells me, well, this equation has been used in this, that, and that context. And you can try to find connections between these different fields of research. Hi. Um, usually I'm dealing with trying to find out solutions of equations like this. And basically they are stationary points. And uh, the usual way is to start from an initial condition and go towards, um, keep on going in time. But this has a drawback, time stepping only approaches minimum. But if we consider a system that is related, yet different, where we define a new dynamic, which is the square of the operator there, then the Jacobian of that is of this form, which means that at every root of this system or every stationary point, we get the Jacobian to be a negative definite. Therefore, all roots of the original system are new, uh, are minima of the new system. That's great because um, we can just start from an initial condition and end up at all the solutions of the original system that we were interested in. So I've been thinking about points recently, um, and specifically in the context of, of immune cells. Uh, so my research focuses in mathematical biology, and I look at uh, where immune cells go to within a tumour. Um, and it turns out that where the cells go to turns out to be quite important for things like drug treatment and, and how well uh, a patient responds to that. So one way that we can think about this is by um, essentially putting a point on each immune cell. Um, and then we can think of, of where the cells are within a tumour as, as a, a set of points in space. And then we can try and use mathematics to describe that, which is what I'm trying to do at the moment. So there's various different techniques we've got to do that, from spatial statistics and, and topological data analysis and, and fun sounding things. And really what I'm wondering at the moment is how we can put those together to get something that's more powerful. I've been fortunate that Oxford and lockdown has been quite a, a good and healing time for me. Um, and I couldn't hope to describe all of this in the space of uh, a one minute video, but um, here are a couple of things. So I've been making some jam, been reading some amazing books, especially this, this one, Wilding. I've been hanging out with my dear friend Alex. And as seen at the beginning of the video, I've been journeying down this beautiful road of Binzi Lane, both to go swimming in Port Meadow, but also to see the wonderful church at the end of the lane. Hi there, my name's Pete Grindrod. And I'm very concerned about the relationship between dog years and elapsed human years. The problem is that for many years we've been using the rule of thumb, which is uh, seven dog years equals one elapsed year, which is the grey line in the plot. Uh, and quite recently, uh, super scientists at the University of California, San Diego, have come up with a different formula. Here it's shown in blue, which involves a logarithm. But I've taken a different approach with an expert panel. Here they are. Uh, the three of us have uh, put our minds around this and uh, we've decided that this doesn't require a logarithm, it requires a dogarithm. And that's the curve that I've shown in red, which is the Oxford-based scientific attempt to map lapsed years onto dog years. Enjoy your day. Hi, I'm Leonie and I'm a PhD student and I'm working on complex network techniques. And when I started to study mathematics, I started studying mathematics and psychology at the same time because I always thought those two interests of mine in like very pure mathematics and solving problems. And on the other hand, having, I don't know, impact on social dynamics or like researching on social dynamics couldn't really go together. So I 
did both like in parallel and then um, I noticed that actually it does have a huge um, interaction that you can use mathematics to model like use complex modeling techniques um, to actually research opinion dynamics or, or different social dynamics and um, that was really cool because I always thought those two couldn't go together and I'm very glad that I can do a PhD in that research area now. Hello my name is Patrick and I'm a mathematician at Oxford and I work in the intersection of two fields, mathematics and machine learning. And in this intersection, I try and study how we can handle the problem of sequential data. And we see this kind of data everywhere. For example, if we were to measure the temperature at a particular location, uh, then you know, take some value and measure it again, we measure it again. And there's this natural sequential structure to the data as it evolves. Or for example, we can measure the vital signs of a patient in a hospital, or we could um, track the motion of a pen on paper. And in all of these cases, we now want to try and understand something about this data. For example, to try and improve our understanding of the climate, or to improve the care given to a patient in a hospital, or to try and design algorithms that automatically understand what it is that you've written or drawn. My name is Michael Giles, and I am an applied mathematician. Thinking about applied mathematics, one of the interesting trends in recent years has been the development of stochastic models. So models that incorporate randomness or uncertainty of some kind. So for example, in mathematical finance, you have the uncertainty in the day-to-day -day variation of stock prices. In uh, groundwater flows, you've got the uncertainty in the porosity of the rock, which varies significantly uh, spatially. And in things like biochemical reactions, you have the uncertainty when the concentration of reactants is so low you know, the probability that two molecules bump into each other and undergo a, a reaction. My own interests are in the computational simulation of, of these things, developing very efficient methods for computing probabilities and average values coming out of such models. 